Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, um, let me uh, let me introduce the the final panel in our session this morning. Uh, we've saved some very good uh, from some very good speakers uh, for last. And just to put the this in context, um, uh, Kurt, since since you just arrived, we we teed off this morning with excellent uh, remarks by the Prime Minister talking about really. Uh, sort of an expectation of maybe a new era in uh, U.S.-Malaysian relations, uh, certainly um, uh, going back to, uh, to building, I think what, the way he put it was building from strength to strength, and I, I thought that was, was very positive. Then we heard about the trade and investment relationship, the outlook for that uh, also seems to be uh, some strong possibilities. We had a real treat from, uh, from the general just now and, and Mike Green talking about the the history of the U.S.-Malaysia security relationship, and it's, it's a great reminder of, uh, of how close, how closely we've worked together. And this panel uh, will will look at uh, U.S.-Malaysia security cooperation and the relationship looking forward. And we're we're honored uh, indeed to have a good friend, um, Admiral Anwar, who is the uh, chairman, uh, former chief of. of of the Malaysian Armed Forces. He's a Navy man. Uh, he's an incredible athlete and um, is sort of one of these Renaissance men that quietly lead Malaysia uh, in, in a very competent way. And it's, uh, I've had the honor to work with him uh, also in the private sector. He's the chairman of the Armed uh, Forces Fund Board uh, in Malaysia, which is a very active uh, in, uh, investor in Malaysia. Um, and we're also joined as by someone uh, all of you in Washington know well, all of you in Malaysia know well, uh, Kurt Campbell. He's the Assistant Secretary for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, also uh, one of the most proactive, uh, interested policymakers uh, in, that we have in the United States, uh, it's really providing great leadership on the relationship not only with Malaysia and ASEAN but throughout East Asia. So we're, we're deeply honored that, that both of you gentlemen could join us. We've uh, given the honor uh, to, to tee off uh, to, uh, to uh, Tansri Anwar. So please, Tansri, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ernest Bauer. Uh, first of all, let me say uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me uh, to this CSIS. And also thank you for ISIS uh, uh, for inviting me to come back to Washington, D.C. I rem remembered four years ago, I was here, uh, but the same discussion uh, uh, we did was in Pentagon with the chairman and the joint staff, uh, General Pete Pace, my counterpart. Uh, we discussed a lot about uh, the way forward in the security and defense cooperation between the United States and Malaysia. Um, I was asked, what do I think about Iraq and Afghanistan? Of course, that was within the four walls. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, um, apart from that, I've been visiting Hawaii every year because uh, I believe in networking with my peers, especially with the admirals, the higher echelon in the U.S. Navy. Um, recently, I was in uh, Hawaii uh, witnessing the change of command of Admiral Walsh, uh, the succeeding Admiral Keating, PACOM. Of course, my uh, counterpart was uh, Admiral Fallon. And uh, we're still very much in touch uh, with the U.S. Navy because in the other company that I have not mentioned, which is the defense, uh, the Glenn Defense Marine Asia, which I am a chairman, we actually um, process all the peer site requirement of the U.S. Navy in the Asia Pacific. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, certainly um, we have heard uh, how Historically, uh, Malaysia has always been a steady and reliable friend of the United States military. Uh, I think one of our common interests uh, is always in defense and security cooperation. 
Undoubtedly, the uh, emergence of various issues uh, has brought about greater challenges in the defense and uh, security environment. Therefore, uh, uh, today, uh, I would like to point to a few areas and, and explore, as, as a subject matter would want us to do, um, some of the interests um, and challenges in the regional security architecture. Uh, the U.S. and Malaysia certainly share a common and uh, a few areas of possible cooperation or actions in our relationship that uh, in particular represent the unrealized potential. Uh, I know um, um, during my tenure uh, uh, as Chief of Navy, um, in fact, if you look at Malaysian foreign policy, we are supposed to only deal uh, bilaterally, not multilaterally. But today, this morning, I'm encouraged by the announcement of the Prime Minister saying the way forward is multilateralism. Um, my experience, uh, when we first uh, uh, suggested that uh, during the hype of the uh, uh, piracies that was mentioned by our Honourable Prime Minister this morning, uh, in 2000, it was about 242 uh, uh, incidences, and they went down uh, to 24. And then I suggested that we do a trilateral coordinated patrol, Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia. And our legal boy said, you can't do that. It is only bilateral approach. But I was very lucky working for the Prime Minister, who is then the Defence Minister. Uh, I said, I suggest well, it's on the merit of the situation that we have to adopt. It's urgent and important, uh, an approach that would enable this uh, uh, operations uh, to be conducted in the Malacca Straits. And at that time, uh, my good friend Tom Fargo, Admiral Tom Fargo, has made a special announcement saying, if the Lutora states do not do anything, we will come and patrol your streets. So it's a big uh, brouhaha. Everybody was very excited. The papers uh, printed is uh, of a man in naval uniform in our uh, front page. And I think we broke through, it's a breakthrough performance when we managed to launch the trilateral coordinated patrol. I think the one that really triggered this is the United States of America, the US Navy. And I, I, I always say, I'll thank, I really thank uh, my good friend, Tom Fargo, for saying this. Because otherwise, we'll be lulled into our bilateral policy. Four months later, um, during the Shangri-La Dialogue, we move ahead. Um, I think we launched the Eyes in the Sky, uh, which is a, a fantastic thing. It's a breakthrough among the uh, littoral state where the, the maritime aircrafts with three uh, national operators on board, which is a fantastic breakthrough because uh, it is an, an example today for all maritime agencies uh, to make it uh, an example of what we did in the Malacca Straits. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, we were addressing about counter-terrorism. Uh, this is also uh, alluded to by the Prime Minister. Um, looking at the current security scenario, uh, Malaysia and US have closely worked together to fight this threat um, um, since 2002, and when Admiral Fallon was PACOM, he visited me in Malaysia, and I brought him uh, to the exotic east, the eastern seaboard, which is Sabah, uh, the Sulu Seas. At that time, we had a threat uh, by the Abu Sayyaf group, uh, but then uh, it showed him that we have deployed two battalions of uh, troops and also the police to all the inhabited islands. Um, and he was very surprised. He said, I didn't know you have had all your troops in all the islands. This is to deny, the strategy is to deny uh, the ASG 
to utilize that island as their launch pads. Um, so slowly, uh, we, we work very closely with the U.S. forces, especially the SEAL team uh, that came with the fast boats and uh, conduct uh, more exercises on how to combat uh, counterterrorism. We have taken various measures to implement the UN Security Council Resolution 1373. Um, further collaboration has resulted in Malaysia establishing the Southeast Asia and Re uh, Regional Center for Counter Terrorism, CSET. And we have also uh, established a center for peacekeeping. Uh, this we have worked very closely uh, with PECOM. Um, we have also engaged uh, with other nations and has been very supportive for the security of the region and beyond the global war uh, on terror. You have heard uh, even from the Prime Minister and General Hashim how uh, this effort uh, has been enhanced. Um, and again, um, he did allude to the U.S. government approved some fund under the initiative FY 1206. And I was the CDF at that time. I was approached. He said, Admiral, would you like the offer by the United States uh, for you to have the FY 1206? That is, this radar systems and the centric system, comm system, to be placed in the eastern seaboard of uh, Sabah. Uh, they told me that the Indonesian will be getting eight. Thailand at that time was about to get also eight radar systems um, and I approached the defense minister and said we ought to accept this we must accept this because that will enable us for a common uh, a system uh, to cross tail especially the centric system and also the radar system in terms of our effort to counter uh, terrorism uh, operations um, Malaysia actually has benefited from this initiative through the installation of these uh, coastal surveillance radars um, and we, in order to monitor all the maritime movements in the area, uh, in particular uh, transnational crimes uh, are of concern in this area. And this initiative has generally assisted uh, in the efforts to combat uh, these threats. Um, the collective role of the littoral states that I mentioned earlier um, we, we have been very successful, and, um, and Thailand has joined us uh, from the three littoral states. Now Thailand joined us last year to be part and parcel of the Malacca States Patrol and the Eyes in the Sky uh, uh, initiative. Uh, apart from the piracy threats, uh, there are other non-traditional security concerns such as drug trafficking, uh, small arms trafficking, and human trafficking uh, alluded to by the General just now. Um, so Malaysia and the United States uh, can look into these areas of collaboration, in especially in, in mitigating the non-traditional uh, security threats. I'm of the view that uh, we could expand our cooperation and engagement towards uh, building a closer relationship between now that we mentioned about this new uh, Coast Guard that virtually is also during my time, a tenure as the Chief of Navy, which we sacrificed 17 ships and 1,200 men from the Navy to form a Coast Guard. Um, sometime um, my officers ask me, is the Chief getting crazy, giving away men and but I said we believe in, 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 in having this Coast Guard to conduct enforcement operations and search and rescue. And this is the only way, uh, the sol only solution that I think we can be very effective. And it's proven uh, now that our Coast Guard has been very effective in uh, uh, countering um, uh, and of course conducting enforcement in our, uh, in our waters. And now uh, we have invited the U.S. Coast Guard to join uh, hands with, uh, with us. But uh, in Bitec, that was uh, uh, mentioned by General Rashim, Bitec, uh, the U.S. Coast Guard is a member, but not our Coast Guard. I think efforts have uh, been made to propose 
that our Coast Guard will be part and parcel of the BITEC uh, arrangement. Um, humanitarian uh, assistance and disaster relief. Um, the Prime Minister alluded to about the tsunami and how uh, we are poised to assist in these uh, sectors. Um, issue of human assistance and disaster relief is becoming big uh, in the region. Uh, we have uh, participated uh, and, and provide provision of uh, human humanitarian assistance. Um, and with our experience in 2004, uh, after the tsunami, I think our arrangement with the U.S. is getting stronger. Um, what we have done is now uh, the World Food Program um, uh, will set up a hub in Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we are moving to that humanitarian leave hub under the World Food Program which will see the development of regional warehouse to store food, uh, supplies, medicine, and other basic amenities. Uh, as you recognize, during the um, uh, tsunami, we allowed the use of our airports. Uh, the U.S. Uh, used the Langkawi airstrip, the Australian the Butterworth airstrip, and French and all the rest in, in the Subang uh, airstrip. Um, in human assistance disaster relief, recently um, the ASEAN tabletop exercise on, on this was co-hosted by Indonesia and Singapore, uh, and it was a tremendous success. I think the tabletop is, is, is a military thing. Uh, we did a lot of rehearsals, and uh, I hope subsequently this will pave the way and anchor the structure of this ambition uh, ASEAN security architecture. Um, the U.S. has expressed its interest in harder operations, human assistance disaster relief operations. Um, and we understand we'll explore ways in which uh, U.S. can contribute in capacity building, uh, equipment, information, and of course, uh, intelligence. Uh, military to military training and interoperability. Uh, it's been mentioned by General Hashim. I'm not going to uh, uh, say any more. But, um, but we are actually uh, looking at um, more areas of uh, especially capacity building from the U.S. forces, how to develop this. Um, and I think uh, the, the, both the forces at the PECOM, uh, which they, they have this meeting, uh, the BITEC meeting in Hawaii uh, very soon, they will address uh, it's not just military to military, not just IMED uh, education and training, but they're looking at human assistance disaster relief operation. Just to share an example, uh, uh, General Ashim mentioned about Cobra Gold. Uh, it has been a very sensitive thing for us to really send our troops. The government has not sent troops, but sent observers to Cobra Gold in Thailand. But when Admiral Rafid, the CNO, uh, approached me and said, uh, Admiral, why don't you send the troops? And I said, uh, Admiral, you know, my government uh, uh, not enabled this, but we continue to send observers. But could you uh, help us in reshaping the scenario to read uh, human assistance disaster relief operations? I'm going to send my troops the next day. Of course, he said, but of course I can do that. Uh, when Admiral Rafid uh, went back, uh, he, before he could launch that, there was a coup in Thailand. So there was no Cobra Gold that year. Um, uh, moving ahead from the current status, uh, I think we can expand these BITEC arrangements. Uh, we must try and look at, as I mentioned, other uh, enforcement agencies. Then, uh, uh, we look service to service activities in terms of join and combine multilateral exercises. Uh, although we don't have the policy that will enable us for multilateralism, but I brought in WPNS, Western Pacific Naval Symposium, a Minex and Divex exercise hosted by Royal Malaysian Navy. Uh, uh, it's also another breakthrough from our uh, uh, policy. Uh, it was done, um, and uh, again, we brought in uh, a, a very a big 
a conference with all the chief of defense forces. There were 17 of them in Kuala Lumpur, uh, the Sheraton Imperial. Uh, we discussed a lot of things in terms of how to move, forge ahead uh, in terms of this multilateral approach. Now, uh, the, have you, you have heard about uh, the provision of assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, today we have a, a, a small delegation that has gone, they are in, actually in Afghanistan now, they're in Kabul. They are assisted by the U.S. forces. They are on the ground uh, exploring how to realize what the Prime Minister has said this morning. Um, we are waiting for them to come back and we should be looking into medical assistance and reconstruction of Afghanistan. Uh, alignment of export controls and non-proliferation. Um, we are very supportive of the efforts uh, towards the ratification of the relevant international conventions uh, such as nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Uh, the Biological Weapons uh, Convention and also the Convention of Landmines. Um, you've heard we are just moving into nuclear power, but we'll, we'll certainly cooperate with the international community in uh, eradicating nuclear weapon smuggling, uh, especially through uh, our waters. Uh, this includes the support for the uh, proliferation of PSI, uh, Security Initiative. Uh, to this end, we have made important contributions to the global system and institutions related to non-proliferation. Uh, As an example, Malaysia is, product, is a productive member of the Asia-Pacific Group on uh, Money Laundering, Financial Action Task Force-style regional body, committed to the effective implementation and enforcement of internationally accepted standards against money laundering uh, and the financing of terrorists. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I could continue to give more examples of the excellent states of uh, uh, bilateral relations between our two countries, but suffice to say um, that the strong bonds of friendship and networking uh, between uh, the higher management between both forces or based on the basis of shared values and principles have enabled our two countries to expand our security and defense cooperation. Um, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would say thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Admiral. Uh, Kurt, um, can I give you the floor? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ernie, thank you very much. And great to see so many friends here. Um, it's been a busy couple of days. Um, and uh, I'd just like to say a word, if I can, about uh, how impressed all of us are, all of us who care and focus on Southeast Asia. Um, there have been some wonderful programs in Washington who focused, which have focused on the region, but I must say, I don't think I've ever seen a program come into being so rapidly and have made such an important contribution on the landscape than the one that Ernie and Mike Green and John Hamry have put together. And I'd just like, if you wouldn't mind, you know, trust me, I know this world pretty well and you rarely get a pat on the back. Please just join us in a thank you for... It's, it's been terrific. It's been a home for uh, friends who visit, an opportunity to meet, and it has helped us establish, or if I can say, really reestablish re a community of people who are deeply interested in the region, and for me, I'm just very grateful. And I, I just, the uh, every day or every other day, I get something from Ernie. It's one of the first things I print out, um, and uh, just very much appreciate the the insights, the guidance, and the advice, and and the leadership in terms of this program. Um, I, I, this is an expert group, so I don't think it's appropriate to rehearse, you know, all the issues that I think that are well known about what President Obama said and what um, Secretary Clinton has said about trying to increase U.S. engagement with Southeast Asia. We've tried to uh, 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 ex uh, make clear about uh, with, with some uh, uh, visits, uh, signing Treaty of Amity and Cooperation, Mekong Initiative. I've tried to go through the region establishing some new uh, machinery mechanisms for uh, uh, increased bilateral uh, engagement. We're going to do this with uh, Malaysia. Uh, uh, invitations uh, to the nuclear summit. We had the largest number of 
Southeast Asian friends visit for such an effort in um, in history, uh, a variety of things, and also, I think uh, most importantly, have taken the first tentative steps uh, on issues related to trade. This is an issue that most friends in Southeast Asia and Asia will say, it's great to see you, we welcome you, thank you very much, but uh, ultimately uh, they're looking to the United States to um, regain its confidence, to feel confident in dealing on economic and trade issues in the Asian Pacific region. I think that's very much in our interest. And we welcome and support the encouragement that we've re received from uh, Asian fr uh, ASEAN friends. So I would say overall um, we have tried to make a clear statement both with individual states, with ASEAN as a whole, and hopefully in a larger um, architectural setting that the United States wants to um, uh, uh, increase our activity in the region. Um, I will say that my, uh, from my general travel in the region, I would say that the United States does have the residual um, uh, capacities of, of a very strong presence in Southeast Asia. But I would also say that at a general level there has been a um, bipartisan lack of focus on Southeast Asia for a sustained period of time. And it is um, important for powerful states like the United States that already have important and critical levels of engagement in a region that is frankly quite important for longer term American strategic interests to appreciate um, when that position is, uh, has eroded or that there are challenges to that position. So I think one of the most important things, and it's difficult often for the United States, it's almost, it's much more, you know, comfortable to talk about triumphs and achievements and major sets of initiatives, but the truth is the United States has to do a better job. And that's one of the reasons that we're so grateful for these visits and also for the programs that uh, Ernie has put together. So I, I'm not going to go through all the basic components, but I think you have a sense that there is a recognition um, that uh, the United States, not just in this administration, but in subsequent administrations, has to do more if we're to um, be effective. And I must also say that this is not simply about Southeast Asia. If we want to have an effective China policy, we need to make sure that we have a strong uh, set of relationships, political, strategic, economically in Southeast Asia. If we want to uh, be clear about uh, including and working with India uh, playing a strong role in Asia. Uh, we need to make sure that we're talking with India about Southeast Asia and with Southeast Asia about India. If we want to continue a strong set of partnerships with our friends in Northeast Asia, uh, enduring uh, uh, commitments in uh, Japan, but new opportunities uh, for engagement with Korea, it's going to be critical for the United States to step up its game uh, in Southeast Asia. And so I hope very much to see that uh, uh, come into, pay, into being. I must say that um, uh, I think it would be fair to say that American friends that have worked for a long period in Malaysia um, were uh, uncertain about what we would find when we tried to step up our uh, interactions. I think um, you know some of us remember a, a complicated period in the 1990s where uh, on the military side we were going extraordinarily well, but occasionally politically we would get um, we would get bogged down in rhetorical flourishes. So we say they're teaching me diplomatic terms. Um, um, what what we're finding more and more, uh, however, now when we interact with Malaysian friends is rather than. Uh, initial commentary about our culture or about our way of doing, uh, our peculiar way of doing uh, diplomacy or occasionally our objectives not only in Asia but elsewhere. Um, the first and most substantial comments uh, that we receive from uh, Malaysian friends is you are most welcome. Uh, please visit often and we want a stronger relationship. Now one of our challenges is of course uh, to communicate that clearly and to run it through what we might call the universal translator for our uh, senior officials uh, in the United States. Uh, what we are finding in almost all of our encounters in Asia is uh, hearing a similar, please come visit, visit often, we want to see more of you, thank you very much. Um, of course in Asia that is generally the polite way of saying, you know, um, we have maybe a few concerns about China. So, so instead of saying that, you say, you're most welcome, Americans. Visit as, as often, as frequently as you'd like. And we've tried to hear that and interpret that appropriately. Obviously, 
all of Southeast Asia seeks a strong, stable relationship between the United States and China. But they feel more reassured if the United States, in addition to working closely with friends in Beijing, are also involved in a parallel, deep, sustained engagement in Southeast Asia. And that's what we're trying to do overall. So there is a substantial tonal change. And in a very short period of time, that has increased confidence in Washington. I think there was a little bit of nervousness. What are we going to hear on specific <laughs> issues? And I think for Malaysian friends, a similar concern. What, is, what are Americans going to raise? But in a very short period of time, I think um, we have seen um, uh, evidence that U.S.-Malaysian uh, relations uh, could ascend rapidly. Now, the, the truth is we have to be careful. I liked Ernie's statements about, you know, take off. And I, I, I want to be more careful than that, because I'm, I'm learning that at the State Department. It's a hard thing for me. But, but, but the truth is there's something to point to here. I, I, you know, the, when people say, well, gee, what are the countries where you could imagine a dramatic improvement in relations between the United States and Southeast Asia, in addition to a region-wide engagement at the ASEAN Regional Forum and other larger initiatives, people generally point to either Indonesia or Vietnam. And there is good reason to expect and hope for those relations to improve rather substantially. But I will also say there are sometimes forgotten, sometimes overlooked, sometimes somewhat disguised, some very powerful component elements in U.S.-Malaysian relations that should give us some confidence about the ability to take off. So for instance, behind the scenes has been an extraordinarily robust uh, military defense relationship much more so than people recognize, much deeper between the United States and Malaysia than anything we have between Indonesia, for obvious reasons, and Vietnam. Now, we do not talk about this relationship in public. We just go about doing the business of it in private. But it's deep. Uh, the trust and confidence that exists not only between the military partners in um, uh, KL and Hawaii, but also in the Pentagon, and that's also uh, shared at the level of uh, civilian uh, components as well. In addition, if you look at the economic relationship, say, for instance, between the United States and Indonesia, it is fairly, um, uh, it's substantial in certain areas, uh, certain kinds of construction, land clearing, uh, some uh, uh, sales of high tech, but primarily it is in the extractive arenas where if you look overall at the relationship between the United States and Malaysia, we've had a very strong economic relations very much beneath the radar screen for decades. Uh, I can recall a few years ago being in a situation where, uh, you know, we asked a group of people to name the top seven or eight trading partners for the United States. And of course, at that time, uh, Malaysia was number eight. And no one in the room of a very esteemed and well-educated group of people understood how deep the economic investment uh, relationship was between our two countries. Now, in the, prime, in the bilateral meeting between the two leaders, uh, in a very courageous way, uh, in a very uh, far-seeing way, the Prime Minister laid out his desire to help Malaysia take that step from what he called the middle level um, to the next level and what would be needed in terms of investment and commitments. And he saw that as a multi- uh, a decade uh, set of challenges, but essential if Malaysia is to maintain its current path and uh, 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 course of potential over the course of the next several years, and given the very real economic challenges from others in the region, and particularly uh, in China. So I simply mention this by, by saying that, that, that um, don't count uh, this relationship out. Don't focus too much on the United States and Indonesia or the United States and Vietnam. Those are important relations. But I, I must tell you, I hope when we have subsequent meetings in the next couple of years that we will surprise people. And in many respects, one of the things we learn in uh, Asian politics, and we get this from our Japanese friends, is sometimes it's not effective to be the one that's out in the spotlight. Sometimes you can make a lot of progress by, by making progress quietly. And I think you're going to see that in U.S.-Malaysian relations. I don't want to convey too much out of school here, but I must tell you, for those of us who were, in, who were treated to a wonderful bilateral, we're in lots of meetings, and you can tell almost immediately whether there's chemistry between two leaders, whether two leaders understand how to interact with one another or they just don't click, or whether there's a sort of a, a race for dominance or you know, who's going who's to control the agenda. Um, 
Prime Minister Najib was as relaxed, confident, capable in this meeting as almost any leader I've seen witnessed in some time. So uh, I'm, I, I don't have that much experience, but in my last 10 years, the three best uh, bilateral meetings I've seen between two leaders, this was one of them. So that should tell you something. And the Prime Minister was extraordinarily effective, not only at conveying a vision of what he wanted to see in his own country, but also talked about the steps that he was prepared to take uh, to advance uh, U.S.-Malaysian relations and the role that Malaysia wanted to play, not just in the region, but increasingly globally as a multicultural uh, democracy on uh, a host of issues. He was also quite clear about the areas of vulnerability and anxiety that Malaysia uh, are coping with and asked for uh, support for the United States and understanding as well. But overall, a deeply uh, powerful uh, a set of commitments and exchanges between the two leaders in a way that I left feeling, uh, you know, had, had a little bit more bounce in my step overall. Um, I, I, I just want to go through, um, the Admiral's already talked about some of those things, but a very specific set of commitments uh, on the part of Malaysia on nonproliferation. Um, without the United States asking, uh, Malaysia decided to dispatch a team to Afghanistan. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister laid out some areas that Malaysia, I, I, I don't want to get in front of uh, his formal announcements, but I think they've decided that they'd like to do, uh, take some efforts in the uh, arena of capacity building and uh, human capital investment. Very impressive. And, and, and again, uh, recognition that uh, Malaysia could play uh, an important uh, out-of-area role in uh, this critical UN endeavor. Um, sp some specific quiet commitments on counterterrorism, um, uh, uh, from uh, procedural steps to training that uh, uh, mesh nicely with the specific um, uh, legislative and judicial steps that uh, help promote much stronger uh, nonproliferation uh, standards. Uh, the PM was very clear on areas that he thought Malaysia had had not taken significant steps in the past, and he sought to remedy and close those uh, loopholes, and uh, 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 very impressive in that respect. We also talked uh, substantially about the defense relationship, and I think he, too, under understands that this has been, in many respects, the backbone of our relationship, and I think his desire is to spread the culture of that cooperation to, shall we say, other elements of the Malaysian government. Now, uh, I, I very much enjoyed uh, my meetings uh, with our friends in uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but un, uh, not uncommon, sometimes you will find in certain countries that the, the attitude uh, sometimes lingers a little bit in ministries of foreign affairs, and there isn't the same sense of engagement and personal commitment there that you might find in the business community or the defense community. And I would take it as our challenge over the course of the next uh, couple of years to try to overcome some of those cultural and uh, sort of residual uh, anxieties and perhaps even a little bit suspicions. And I th was struck on my visit after two days of talks, the last hour of those talks were considerably better than the first hour. And we hope to uh, continue that so that it's not simply in certain pockets of the, of the Malaysian government, but basically uh, in the Prime Minister's office and other parts of the bureaucracy, a general consensus that it is the interest of the country to move forward on a stronger relationship between our two countries. And lastly, um, the PM made a very clear statement on uh, the desire to play a more substantial role in the TPP and encourage the United States to be confident on these issues in a way that we've seen from various leaders in Southeast Asia and Asia as a whole, from uh, uh, the uh, uh, Minister Minter in Singapore, from um, uh, 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 friends in Korea and the like. And I must say, these expressions of confidence in the United States, the enduring capacities of the United States to recover from our current uh, 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 challenges and difficulties, uh, a desire to see the United States to be a confident player in the trading engagement of, of the Asian Pacific region, the in, new investment opportunities. Uh, it's, most, it's most welcome and it gives us a sense of confidence that, that others uh, see this and the role that we could play, but some specific ideas on TPP. Now, um, I conclude, uh, Ernie, just two last things. L let us also be clear that the two sides tried not to avoid the issues on which there will be continuing uh, 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 
discussions, perhaps some difficulties and challenges. And I think any good relationship um, is able to deal with those issues. I saw in the meeting between the President and President Hu that, you know, the United States and China has had to deal with some very challenging issues over the course of the last couple of months. I think there is a uh, strong desire on the part of our Malaysian friends to see the United States play a more consequential role in trying to bring peace in the Middle East. And so the fact that Malaysia has a, in, in, in their perspective, a very purposeful commitment uh, to these issues is something that the United States must uh, take seriously. And we recognize that there is a global uh, uh, Islam now that not just focuses on their own backyard, but on issues of what they consider uh, justice and uh, uh, peace uh, beyond uh, their borders. And so that was made very clear to us. And from our perspective, um, we, um, we uh, cherish and uh, support uh, the general uh, uh, process of democratization inside, uh, inside the country. We, we occasionally have some anxieties about the role of uh, Islamic law, how it is applied with, with uh, the Malaysian Commonwealth law, Commonwealth law and, and how these two sort of secular uh, and uh, religious trends uh, in, in the country can be reconciled. And uh, we watch that carefully. Um, we want very much for a uh, benevolent, um, uh, uh, open, uh, engaged, traditional form of Southeast Asian uh, yeah, Islamic uh, uh, worship and philosophy to continue to be the dominant trend inside the country. And occasionally we see some signs that concern us. I also, uh, in our meetings, um, uh, we must say, and I think it's well known to all of you, um, uh, uh, Anwar has many friends in the United States. Uh, very high-level friends, people who care about him, and we want very much uh, uh, for uh, his treatment to be just, and um, we uh, are watching carefully in this regard. And so the fact that we were able, I think, both to talk about the issues that we're closely aligned, but also issues uh, of some challenge without getting our feelings immediately hurt and saying, well, that's it, I think is a tribute to uh, growing maturity in the relationship as a whole. Now, going forward, Ernie, I would just say there are, in addition to these five areas, which are the dominant areas, they are the backbone of the relationship, they are the areas that we are going to put substantial effort and focus on. Um, uh, we've also seen uh, Malaysia step up in a very exciting way on climate change, not just in limiting um, uh, uh, traditional emissions, but also looking at questions associated with forestation. Um, some of Malaysia's commitments are as robust, far-reaching, and uh, um, uh, almost game-changing as any country in the world. And the PM was able to discuss and talk about these issues in, a, in an extraordinarily nimble uh, way, in, in a way that many other leaders cannot. Um, Malaysia has also played a very important role on thinking about next steps on architecture. And I must say, in, in stark contrast to the 1990s, um, where there was some ambivalence about the United States. Far from it now. The question is the terms, the appropriate mechanism about how the United States can and should be a more active member in this next phase of multilateralism. I think it is all uh, well understood that the 1990s was primarily transpacific. Lots of institutions in which the United States played a more important role, APEC, ASEAN Regional Forum. I think the last decade was one in which much of the action was uh, Pan-Asian. Um, and, and the United States perhaps wasn't as actively involved as we might be. And I think the next phase, we want to see a role in which both the United States but also other critical countries like India are more actively engaged in how we do that and try not to be in a situation where we over-promise and under-deliver. And I must say, um, quite honestly here, you know, um, it's very easy in, when you're out of government to talk about canceled meetings and missed summits. But the truth is that the President has been in power uh, only a year, a uh, year and, and a couple of months. He's made very clear he'd like to do a better job of engagement, but we've had to postpone two trips. This is just the nature of how challenging 
um, these jobs are and how difficult it is for chief executives to be able to find the time uh, to uh, you know, ensure the proper level of engagement. We want to be careful that we do not overpromise and underdeliver, but I think Malaysia in particular, working with other countries in Southeast Asia, have communicated to us their desire to have us more actively engaged, whether it's in the East Asia Summit or some sort of configuration of ASEAN plus 150, whatever the new group is, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, uh, I think that would be important. We also think the third and final thing, Ernie, is that, is that you know, it, it, it perhaps is time for the United States to think a little bit creatively about how we can encourage uh, steps uh, uh, in uh, the South China Sea to ensure that we do not have uh, uh, a competition uh, uh, devolving to bilateral or unilateral steps. We think the code of conduct has been important. Um, uh, the United States has occasionally in 1995 and again in 2002 had statements or made uh, uh, suggestions or contributions to this overall effort. I think we're going to be watching closely. We've seen some things that uh, cause us some concern. Uh, and they're not just concerned with one nation but several nations. And I think we'd like to think um, uh, creatively about how the United States can uh, make a clear uh, uh, set of uh, statements that uh, uh, underscore our commitment to maintaining peace and stability and uh, maintaining other uh, strong and central uh, American uh, strategic interests in terms of freedom of navigation and the like uh, in uh, places like the South China Sea. Uh, so with that, I have to say I'm, I'm fairly bullish. You know, I try not to over uh, commit here, but uh, I think you have all the um, ingredients uh, for a careful, uh, quiet uh, liftoff in uh, U.S.-Malaysian relations. And I thank you, Ernie, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you very much.